Kale was used by Native Americans for some really amazing uh, uh, uses of the natural space. The Native Americans were here, they were searching, uh, using the land as a, both a, a resource as well as a place to come from the ocean inland during the winter. And as they would arrive, they would leave uh, traces of their work. And on the property, you can find different spots where there's, uh, there were tools, there were remnants of fish, uh, bones that have all been excavated from uh, the work that was done by different universities. And so we know that the property was used by Native Americans for quite some time um, for a variety of different uses. Uh, there's a, a quarry that where felsite was pulled out of the ground and was used to make tools. And that quarry is still here today and, and we can take kids through it and they can really get to see how uh, Native Americans were using the, the land at that time and the, and the benefit of that. If I could talk to Robert Seaver Hale right now, I think I would ask him if he understood the magnitude of what he did. And the gift of the land of Hale was a wonderful gesture, I'm sure, in its time. And I'm sure it meant a lot to him. And I'm sure he had a very singular purpose and probably a, a multifaceted purpose and understanding of what he was giving. But I wonder if he really could comprehend, looking today, at what it has turned out to be and where it can actually go from here. And I think that's what I would focus on with him because I don't know that he could possibly have comprehended all the good that's been done with the gift that he gave. The concept of starting here was really uh, Robert Seifer Hale's concept. The kids would get outside from the city and they had this really unique opportunity to experience nature, to be in the woods, and to leave Boston at the time and come to Hale. And he and his brother, who owned property in Dover, um, began bringing scouts through Dover, and they would come onto Hale's property and they'd get to experience the woods and be outdoors and really be in the wild and have that uh, really unique experience themselves. And that began in 1918 when Robert Seaver Hale penned a letter to the scouts saying, You can use my land and you can come outdoors and you can have this amazing experience. And that's what uh, was the founding moment for Hale Reservation. And as Hale evolved into the 20s and into the 30s, scouting uh, grew. It was a big movement. Uh, Robert Seaver Hale was very involved in that movement. He was involved internationally in traveling to Europe uh, to be part of the international scout movement. And he uh, w really believed in this unique experience for boys to be outside and enjoying nature and um, being on their own, doing things that today we would not let the boys do, and that is experience the woods uh, unsupervised, actually. And so uh, today we wouldn't allow that to happen. Robert Seaver Hale sort of believed that that was a core tenant to the experience. What we would do is we get on the, uh, we we take the trolley to Dudley Street Station on the on what is now called the Orange Line. We'd ride out to Forest Hills, which is the end of the Orange Line. We'd get on a trolley out to uh, the Denham Line, where Mosley's is, and we get out there at Route 109 and hitchhike out five miles to the Dover Road, and then get out of whatever car picked us up at the corner of the Dover Road at 109, walk down that street a short distance, turn right on a dirt road, and go by the Rangers camp. We were in Scotland. Yeah, when we were here as a kid, which is in the early 50s, the way it worked then is that there were, this was called Scout Land at that time, and there were Boy Scout troops in Boston uh, who all and had, on their own, their parents would come out, the fathers, and build a cabin. Uh, that was the way it was worse. And I was from Jamaica Plain, so we had a cabin that was down near Starrow Pond. And the usual arrangement, it seems like the parents, the fathers would all be in the cabin and all the kids would be out in tents. And you know, we'd cook out and we'd run around wild in the woods. We used to go swimming all the time in Starrow Pond, which was interesting swimming because it was full of down trees and all of that, but we didn't know any better. So that was a, our usual arrangement, and that went on. I sort of did that probably until we were, you had to be 11 to be a Boy Scout up until we were about 14. As when we were here as kids, Lon Smith was the ranger here, and he uh, had a 
you know, he had a difficult job. He was probably the only one here, as I remember, and there were all sorts of people coming and going. It wasn't very structured, and he was trying to keep some kind of a lid on the place. And so Lon Smith would frequently uh, walk around when the troops were here, drop in, see what was going on. And he seemed to get along very well with the parents, because my father, my fathers would come from these things, and my father wanted to get out of the house. And I think they were all in the cabin. He would go up and be sitting around talking with them half the night. And so I think there was a good relationship there, but at least all the kids were a bit worried about him. He looked very fierce, <laughs> I would say, I'd say. But he probably was a very nice man. I just never knew him in that way, you know, because we were younger. And by in the 50s, when we were coming here, we're using the place, you know, one weekend a month bringing Boy Scouts, and the other weekend we were coming out here. I mean, my wife and I and our friends, we all came out here all the time and we'd have, you know, we had parties and we'd walk around the place and see we weren't doing anything bad, but I think he was a little uneasy about that, you know, and, and so I think we were, we kind of avoided him at that time. <laughs> I don't know a ton about Lon Smith, but Lon was the executive director prior to Jim Early and after Robert Seaver Hale. Um, Lon was here for quite a long time and was instrumental in the scout movement and, and moving the organization forward as, as things progressed, including the building of Noarant Pond Dam. Um, I do know that Lon was an avid hunter um, and he had some friends who were neighbors and while Hale was not a hunting preserve per se, he and the neighbors had their spots that were great for duck hunting and for other types of hunting and it was an important component of Lon's existence here at Hale was using the property for um, uses that a few other people really got to enjoy. Um, some have said, Ron, said Lon was a little rough around the edges. Um, I think it, clearly he loved Hale and loved what the organization was all about and, and did some amazing things, again, to build a foundation of what we are today. Well, it was a, it was a little square building, maybe two stories high, and, uh, and there was a store on the first floor, and you could buy you know, camping things if you needed it, or candy and gum and stuff of that sort. And then when, where it was located, I, I, I saw some photographs and it looked like the same place that I remember back from 1942, 43. And then if you went off to the right of that, you would come to Starl Pond. Well, we got we down to swim at Starl and we could swim right off this little dam. And, but uh, one thing about swimming at Starl that I remember is sometimes we'd be sitting in the rocks later and there'd be these blood suckers. We called them blood suckers on us. But you could get rid of them by putting some heat on them and some kids would use a cigarette stub. And, and then, you know, a lot of kids, I mean, I don't remember, there was a lot of smoking done, but, but uh, it wasn't uncommon to find kids 12 or 13 smoking, and, you know. I mean, you, I mean, they could buy cigarettes in the store, and, and uh, sometimes they pick up butts in the street and light butts that were thrown away and smoke them. <laughs> Some of the scouts on Sundays, they'd go to church, and when they went to church in town, they'd uh, go into the, the local Catholic church, and they were always... Uh, sitting in the back of the church. And some local folks in Westwood have said they thought it was really weird that the scouts would be sitting at the back of the church. Uh, they just felt like it was almost segregation. These city kids would come out, they'd hike into Westwood Center on Sunday morning, they'd go to church and they'd sit at the back of the church. What we've learned is that while Westwood residents wondered why they were there, the scouts were told to sit at the back because they were stinky and smelly because they'd been out all weekend. And so they were told, you know, stay at the back of the church, don't get close to anybody else. So this scouting movement was, a, was really a big uh, a thing in the times in the 30s um, and into the 40s. And as the 40s evolved and times changed, Hale began to evolve a little bit as well. Um, Robert Seaver Hale passed away. The organization was renamed to the Robert Seaver Hale Scouting Reservation. Um, at which time um, there continued to be scout movement, but there was some, also some relationships that were established with the um, Jewish Combined Philanthropy, um, as well as with um, the YMCA. And those groups began to bring kids out here, and it started a, a transition and a movement of Hale from being just about scouting to being about groups experiencing Hale in a very different way from all around Greater Boston. And that was... Um, a, a big change in the organization. I asked us what we, how we were going to get through the next semester without money. They said, well, can you run the Boy Scout troop? And St. Ignatius, which is a parish right out near BC, had a Boy Scout troop and they had a cabin out here. So we, we had a deal that they paid out tuition. We had to take these kids camping one weekend a month and we had to take them to summer camp for two weeks. But the other three weeks, 
my friends and I, and we had a cabin out here too, and it was not very well regulated. And so what happened, uh, we would have them out here for one week, but the other three weekends, we would use that to come out, you know, it was sort of party place. And I think the rangers and the people, they had all these people coming and going like that, and they didn't have good control. So they finally decided, I think they, they wanted to get rid of all these cabins. And if we were gonna come out here, that we would have to use the cabins that, uh, that they have now built, you know, so they could pay some kind of fee and stay there. So, uh, so I think the way they resolved that, because it was a rule that if a cabin burnt down, you couldn't be rebuilt. So I don't know this for sure, but it seemed rather strange that in about a one year period, on a Sunday night, every cabin in the place burned down. So you can see a few, if you go down Starrow's Pond, there's like a chimney there, that was a cabin uh, that burned down. One by one, they all disappeared. And I think that's how they control that thing. Because I don't think there are any cabins like that now. These sort of shacks, are there, are there any of those? I'm not sure. There, there, were, there were troops that came up there with adults you know, camping out like scout troops did, like I, like I did down in Middleborough with the kids and I did in the Blue Hills. So there was troops camping there. I just happened to be in a troop that, that there weren't that many adults connected with it except the scoutmaster. And they, it was these older guys who had, a couple of them had Eagle and Life Scout and had merit badges and were in it. We kind of came in just at the time when they were beginning to get drafted for World War II. So the, the, the troop basically ceased to function. In the 60s, Hale was transforming a bit. Scouting was less of a big emphasis, and the idea of working with other organizations became a key component. The Combined Jewish Philanthropies uh, was beginning to really grow their camp program, and Hale realized that it was important that recreational opportunities for summer camps be expanded, and that was the initiation of the construction of Noanic Pond, which happened in the early 60s, and the building of the dam, and that idea that a big body of water would be instrumental in creating a community that would support camps and uh, bringing students from all different areas. And as that grew and evolved into the 70s, when busing was a big issue in the greater Boston area, uh, Hale was sort of at the cutting edge of that and begun to bring students from all different communities to Hale to have this real unique experience. Jim Early, who was the executive director at the time, was instrumental in this. In fact, Jim was known to drive the buses at times. No matter what it took to get the kids, he would go get them. He wanted them from Charlestown, from Boston, from Roxbury, from Dorchester. He wanted them to have this really unique experience. So he himself would meet up with different owners and organiz uh, of all different organizations, and they would bring kids out here to, to have this amazing experience. The pond, which now is the centerpiece of what happens in Hale, uh, Noena Pond is really the core of the organization. The building of that was transformational, taking in a swampland, essentially, something we couldn't really do today, and turning it into a pond um, really changed the organization. It is, again, the hub of what we do, and today, when we count up our number of lessons offered, we offer approximately 100,000 swim lessons on an annual basis at the pond. And swim lessons are incredibly important, um, not only for young students from, from any community, but especially students from urban communities where uh, the rates of drowning for urban youth is substantially greater than those who have access to ponds and have those opportunities. So the pond and the swimming program really gives uh, students and young children opportunities that are life-saving in, in this specific case. Uh, and that really blossomed in the 70s under Jim's leadership, as well as the fact that uh, the expansion of education programs at Hale had one of the first ropes courses in the New England area. Not the first, but one of the first ropes courses and was on a sort of the cutting edge of this idea of team building and experiencing the outdoors in a cooperative yet challenging way could really bring students to have a really unique experience. And Hale did an amazing job with that. And, and Jim, as a leader, brought it to the point where in the 70s, almost all Boston public school students came to Hale for field trips. It was part of their curriculum throughout the district that students would come here to be on the ropes course. And the program was quite expansive at that time, as well as in the 70s, the after school program that picked up and then the growth into the 80s of the Hale Day Camp program. Um, those expansions under Jim's amazing leadership 
uh, were really what sort of positioned the organization, organization to be what it is today. In the 60s, Membership Beach began. It wasn't called that at the time. Uh, I believe it was called the Dover Westwood Conservation Club, and it began as the pond was constructed and one of the beaches was set aside. The idea that local individuals would come and have their own space that they could really enjoy uh, a beach and a pond and access to the water. Um, that has been quite an evolution of a program that is now just over 50 years old. Um, it's turned into something that is spectacular. In, in fact, incredibly unique one of a kind. It is not a health club and it's not just a private beach. It's a place where not only are families experiencing this great community but where they're getting lots of activities. It's, a, it's this great value um, for what you get which is swimming lessons, ropes course, uh, arts and crafts, archery, uh, there's yoga classes for families. It's this all-inclusive what we do at camp but for your family. Um, it's unique. There's really nothing else like it. Uh, my name is Lennox Chase, a uh, board member for Hale Reservation. Growing up in the city uh, as a kid, especially pre-teens, uh, the summer activities range from playing in uh, there were two or three burnt out triple deckers in my neighborhood. And that was pretty much the, the nucleus of our, our daily experiences in the summer. And, uh, but now, so many years later, decades later, having two children that have an experience of Hale of swimming and hiking and and meeting new kids from different towns and different backgrounds. Uh, it's a dramatically different experience than I had as a child and I'm very happy to be able to provide that for my children. My kids were not swimmers as, as when they came to Hale. And we've been here for about five years now. My, my oldest is 10 and my youngest is seven. And as a, someone in their mid 40s who could barely do a doggy paddle, I'm very happy to say that my children are they love swimming, they're fish now. They, 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 just, they, they swim all the time and it's, it's second nature to them. And, and just, I'm just so happy that my kids have had the experience of coming to Hale and in particular Membership Beach and, and just participating in all the various uh, lessons and programs that are available and, and, the, and the safety level at Hale in particular is just out, off the charts. I mean, there's so many lifeguards. I, I lose count sometimes. All these lifeguards are just everywhere and they're, they're, they're ultra cautious and they're, they're really invested and engaged in their job and it's just as a parent you feel like your kids are safe and, and I know they are because of uh, the high quality training that the lifeguards receive at Hale. I've been at the beach now for about 20 years and a lot has changed in our programming and uh, kind of what you see around here. Um, the bathrooms are incredibly different, uh, but the same wholesome family vibe remains the same. And I think that is something that be very upsetting to lose. Uh, you still get that strong community feel um, just stepping onto the beach which is why people come back year after year. <laughs>Ola program or Hale Outdoor Learning Adventures is a program that began um, in 2011. It began uh, as a partnership with the Boston Public Schools and a organization in Boston called Boston After School and Beyond. As they began to look at how to truly impact urban youth and make sure that their summer slide experiences isn't as dramatic as others. Um, urban youth fall farther behind typically, especially lower income students because they don't have as many opportunities that their suburban counterparts have. And so our program, OLA, began as part of a national study that was looking at the impact of summer learning loss and whether a five-week intensive program that uh, pulls together um, uh, academics, math, English language arts, and science, as well as has the enrichment activities that are such as the things we offer here at camp, can truly, statistically, significantly impact summer learning loss for urban youth. And the study was a, a four-year project with pilot years and then actual implementation of a randomized controlled trial study. And the outcome is that yes, when students attend for 80% of the time, we see an impact, a statistically significant impact, that we are helping urban youth continue to excel so that when they return back to school in the fall, they're better off. Um, 
The program has had great success and continues to grow today. We've been able to expand it since it began. So well, currently I'm the, the Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the Boston Celtics. So one of the more amazing programs that I've come to learn about at Hale is, is the OLA program and, and all the amazing work that they're doing in partnership with the Boston Public Schools. And my son John, in fact, has been a counselor over there in the OLA program for two years, going on his third year this year. And uh, it, for him, it's one of the most rewarding things he does in the entire year. And it's, it's hard work, but it's, it's a labor of love, and he absolutely loves what he does. And he'll come home and, and impart some of the, the activities of the day on me, and, and we'll talk about it. And you know, as, it, as it turns out, as those students leave for the, after the summer and they go back to school in the fall, we have a wonderful opportunity where I came to the, the ownership of the, the Celtics and said, you know, what a great treat it would be for those students that are all together in the summer at Hale to come together and take in a Celtics game. And um, for the last four years, I believe, we've provided 80 tickets to a game for the whole, the whole program, the students, their parents, their families to come in and take in a Celtics game together. And it's been a great night for them. It's been a great night for the Celtics. We do a lot of that stuff. But I'll tell you, the OLA program is a very, very deserving recipient of a, of a night like that. As a first-generation college graduate, I definitely appreciate what the OLA program provides to inner-city kids. Uh, I was able to uh, have opportunities outside of uh, my, my, my neighborhood, and, and I can identify with the opportunities that OLA provides to kids to broaden horizons and see a different uh, way of life and, and, uh, and, and expand their, their boundaries. And, and see how limitless life can be and the abundance of opportunities that are available if you uh, step outside of your comfort zone, per se. And I, and I kind of strongly identify with the kids in OLA because they're able to see another way of life and uh, see what a big world we live in and uh, identify with uh, a variety of things that may not be familiar to them as a child, but they can see things that are beyond their natural neighborhood. Hale today is a place that is a vibrant, active community, year-round running programs. Um, it's something that I think uh, many of us who work here, who've been involved and volunteered, are incredibly proud of the work that we've done to evolve the organization to where we are today, with over 8,000 students coming between September and June, over 4,400 students from 70 communities that are here during the summer months, um, and growth in the future, things we plan to do that will expand our work including opening a semester school in Trepid Academy, which is slated to open in uh, 2018. So these are exciting projects that have really built on the, the foundation of what Hale has been over many, many decades, 100 years of, of incredible work. They've brought us to a place where we can see further growth into the future. In my opinion, the direction of Hale I see heading is going this way. And it's, it's a, if it were a stock, I would buy it. It's, it's growing. Um, Eric and the team and the management and the board are innovative and they're enterprising and they're leveraging what they should leverage, which is the, the resources that they have at hand, at hand to take hail from where it is now to the next level. I think looking towards the future at Membership Beach, we are definitely looking into new programs and um, kind of developing our facilities a bit more, but in general I want to keep it very similar to the wholesome family environment that we have today um, and that we had 20 years ago that I grew up in and um, I, I oftentimes get into conversations with parents who now have kids coming to Hale and they admit that they uh, 20 years back had been members here as well um, and they some of them even had worked here um, but I think most of the time when I think of the future here, my, I think of my nieces and nephew, or my niece and nephew, uh, and how they're learning to swim here and they are participating in all the programs. This year, Sienna is going to be, um, doing Guppy Gang. She's four, so that's exciting. Um, and how she'll have all the same stories and experiences and memories that I had, um, growing up here as well, which is really cool. 
And from that study, what we learned at OLA is helped to inform the next steps at Hale. And what we've learned is that a public-private partnership and working uh, closely with a large urban district, the result can be positive. And so it's led us to our next big initiative, which is Intrepid Academy at Hale, a semester-long uh, high school-based program for 11th grade students that is a partnership with the Boston Public Schools, again, to bring urban youth, to give them that unique semester away experience where they're studying the traditional uh, activities that they might be studying in a school, but doing so in an outdoor experiential setting with an integrated uh, curriculum. Um, so that project is underway and we look forward to it beginning in 2018. My experience as a parent with my kids at Hale was, was really fun. It started out in, in the very earliest ages when it was time to get the kids out of the house and we would literally pack up the backpack and walk up into Hale for hours and it, was, it gave my kids a very early appreciation for what Hale offered in terms of its natural beauty and all the expanse of land and water and trees and it was just fabulous. So as they grew older it became more of an opportunity for them to expand their lives there and when they became of age to work, the very first jobs were all at Hale, all three of my boys, um, starting out at the guard shack and then working their way up as campers and ultimately as a, um, as a counselor in the um, OLA program. So for me, getting involved in Hale was actually a very easy thing to do and, it, and I think once I did, it opened up my eyes as to the breadth of what I was actually getting myself into. But I was always raised as, as in my family to be someone to give back to the community and make sure that you were always involved and being thankful for what you had and looking for ways to give back to the community. So that's always been our mindset as a family that came from my parents and it's something that I've always tried to do and when we moved to Conant Road and became an abutter and I got the phone call from Eric saying let's come over and talk about this, it was, it was an easy one for me and it was, it was easy because it was right there physically, geographically but more so it was easy because once I got in there and did a tour and started talking to Eric and understanding exactly what was going on, I realized I've lived in Westwood my entire life and I don't really know half of what they're doing, a fraction of what they're doing in Hale. And once I got in and opened my eyes, I said, okay, this is a story that needs to be told. This needs to be broadcast. This needs to be publicized. People need to understand what is going on here in these woods that basically a lifelong resident of Westwood had no idea what was happening and that's, that was very valuable to me and very important to me to make sure I was able to do that. Uh, one of my granddaughters works at a program where these kids come out in the summer from the city on buses and, and they seem to need a lot of help. I mean they seem to show up without lunches, without bathing suits and all that so it's been very good for her to see all those kids and, and try to deal with them and also it's been great for the kids. I think it's the happiest days they have in their life here because they come here out all summer. So I think the place is being really used properly, you know, with lots of stuff, lots of programs and it was an opportunity because uh, before there was, since it wasn't very structured, I mean I would, there was another program they had, I would just bring kids around and, you know, say that's a rock, that's a tree, talk about different animals and so on. So now it's much more formal and, and the people are actually trained to do this, you know, see. So, I mean, that's how I view the place now. I live in Norwood, Mass, which uh, is right next door to Westwood and Hale Reservation. And I, I found out through a friend of mine I've known for decades, and she recommended that I join the board because of my background and uh, the age of my children, uh, who are now 10 and 7, two boys, Howie and Max. And uh, being an inner city kid, I'm very happy to have them have the Hale experience because Going up in the city, I, I, I was accustomed to playing in vacant lots and, and burnt out buildings, and that was like a blast for us. It was, it was like Disneyland. But, uh, <laughs> but now that my kids come out here, I, I'm just very happy that they've had a different experience. What has Hail meant to me? Um, well, I think it's a, just such a marvelous opportunity for uh, young men, and now, of course, it's girls and boys. I went down there occasionally, and um, you know, for something to explore or maybe go see the beavers or something. But, um, so I, I learned by word of mouth and, every, and everybody knew what was going on at Hale Reservation in Westwood.